in the beginning. It's going to take us a while to read every verse, so here we go. No, those uh, <laughs> in the beginning, those three words, that's all that's required for someone to know that you're referring to the book of Genesis in the beginning. Now, you take it to the fourth word. In the beginning, God, the addition of the fourth word is all that's required for us to believe what the book of Genesis says and understand what it's all about. Because it is a book of the beginnings, but even the beginning had a beginning, right? Before anything existed at all, before there were any beginnings whatsoever, there was God, God is before it all, and he's the first one mentioned. He's the central figure of the book of Genesis. And, of course, the central figure of the book of the Bible as a whole, and of the whole universe itself. And so if we come to grips with God at the forefront, then everything else really is a piece of cake. Don't want to, though, get too far ahead of ourselves. Genesis is the beginning of the Bible, given to us by God so we would know the beginning of all things. And we do see this beginning of all things. We see in Genesis the beginning of the universe. We see the beginning of humanity, the beginning of marriage, the beginning of work, of sin, of death, the beginning of the gospel promise, the beginning of the fulfillment of that promise through God's nation, which he begins, and much more. The book of Genesis shows us the beginning of grace. And it shows us the love of God for humanity as he reaches out to restore what mankind destroyed in the fall. And we're going to see that from the very moment that sin entered the world, God immediately moves to right what went wrong. And so we'll spend a little bit of time on those first three chapters because the remaining 47 chapters in Genesis are dedicated to show how God went about writing what went wrong. Genesis, we need to emphasize, is not the beginning of God, but it is the beginning of God's gospel. Our salvation finds its root in the pages of Genesis, and so its importance cannot be overlooked by the Christian. Now, I'm going to just touch on a few things briefly before we get into the text, and we'll touch on it far briefly than what I'd originally intended for sake of time. We get the name Genesis, by the way, from the uh, Greek translation, the Septuagint, they called it Genesis, and that's really the word in Greek. Genesis is the Greek word and refers to origins, birth, genealogies. Uh, The word is often seen as a division marker, and you'll see this if you open, if you have a study Bible, many times it'll say that uh, you've got nine or ten, depending on how they count them, divisions from the different genealogies that are listed in the book of Genesis. You've got the origin of the earth, starting in chapter 2, verse 4. You've got the lineage of Adam, 5, verse 1. Uh, of Noah in chapter 6. Of the sons of Noah in chapter 10. Of uh, Shem and uh, Terah in chapter 11. Of Ishmael in chapter 25. Of Isaac in chapter 25. Of Esau and of Jacob. And it does mark those divisions. But it seems that uh, the Bible mentions some of those family lines just to show Uh, some follow-up of what happened to the family. And so some of the Bibles that say that these are definitely the divisions of Genesis, well, it can be divided that way, but it's not hard and fast. That's not really the main point. The full attention is focused on one particular family, the one that would bring forth the promised Messiah. So some of these things come to an end, but the only uh, genealogical line that follows all the way through is that to Jesus. And by the way, that picks up in Matthew and and Luke, and it shows it all the way there. But again, we're going to get way ahead of ourselves if we go that far. Uh, It was written by the man Moses, and uh, there's been some debate about that in recent years, but really for thousands of years up till the 18th century, it was unquestioned that it was Moses who wrote it, and we can get into the arguments about that, but we just won't for the sake of time tonight. Obviously, Moses was not a physical witness to these things. His birth is recorded in the book of Exodus, not Genesis. So he received his knowledge from somewhere, and that's to be understandable. It's very possible that oral histories about some of these things, about the origins of the nation of Israel, origins of the earth, were preserved, and Moses put those things into writing. Some speculate that perhaps even some people wrote those things down. Moses compiled them together and wrote them. And that's absolutely possible. The idea that Moses relied on some previous oral histories or even written histories doesn't take away from the argument that he himself wrote the book. Somebody had to write it in the form that we have, and history is overwhelmingly positive 
that Moses is the one that did it. Now, keep in mind that oral history doesn't necessarily mean inaccurate history. We can fall into this trap of thinking that Moses and other writers, you know, they were so far removed from these events that they wrote about. And that just isn't true. When you follow the genealogical timelines that are listed in the Bible, it's very specific, actually, within the book of Genesis. And there's a chart, I don't know how much you can read of that, that takes us all the way from Adam to Abram, Abraham. But even if you go beyond Abraham and you take it all the way out to Moses, well, we know from the book of Exodus that Moses was the son of Amram, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. And so we know that Moses, of course, grew up in the house of Pharaoh, but his nursing mother his, was his biological mother. She tended to him. And, of course, he knew his older brother, Aaron. Between the two of them, they would have taught him his family history, may have even been able to meet his biological father. But due to the lifespans, the length of the lifespans, you can see that, well, Aram probably knew Jacob. Jacob surely knew Abraham. Abraham could have known Shem or Noah, who survived to his day. Noah lived in the days of Enosh, and Enosh obviously knew his grandfather Adam. So Moses isn't nearly as far removed from primeval history as we might otherwise think. We're only talking five or so generations away from having firsthand knowledge of the days of creation. So Moses had access to a lot of information. Of course, we need to remember that all of this comes in the doctrine of inspiration as well. Moses didn't write the book out of pure historical research. He was inspired. He was guided by God, the Holy Spirit. Anything that came to him through historical lines first passed through the divine inspiration of God before being placed in the scripture. So we know that it's accurate. Now, we also know that the book of Genesis is important. And the fact that it is inspired is important for us to remember as we come to the book. Because of all books in the Old Testament, Genesis has come under all kinds of scrutiny today, both from outside the church and from those inside the church. And there have been many attempts to try to divide the book into that which is truly historical from that which is purely theological. Now, let's make this point absolutely clear up front. The Bible never makes that distinction. We cannot, and we really should not, deny the fact that Genesis does teach theology. It teaches a lot of theology, and it does so from a certain point of view, and it does so without apology. But that does not mean that anything in the book of Genesis is anything less than historically accurate. The Bible can teach theology and history at the same time, and compromise on neither one. And so the history may involve the supernatural, but guess what? If the supernatural really did happen, then the only inaccuracy would be not to address it at all. And the Bible does address it, because that's the way it happened. It records the way things happened. Now, should there be any doubt among Christians as to whether or not to accept the biblical account as it stands in Genesis, we need to remember that much of what we read in the New Testament is founded directly on the teaching found in the book of Genesis. Go all the way to the end of the Bible. Revelation, we read of a pure river of life and a tree of life as we enter into the eternal state in heaven. A lack of a curse. Revelation 22, 1 through 3. Well, that's a direct reconciliation of what we read in Genesis chapter 1 through 3. God's very plan of salvation is to restore not just us to live in eternity with him in heaven, but to restore the universe to what he originally intended it to be. We see what that is in Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3. In Revelation 20, verse 14, we read of the death of death. Well, in Genesis 3, 19, we read of the origin of death. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, we read of Satan, who is called the serpent of old. Well, in Genesis 3, 1, we see him in his original form. Going from Revelation to Romans, Romans 5, we read of how death spread to all men through Adam, but the free gift of grace is available to all men through Jesus Christ. Again, finding its origins in the book of Genesis. In fact, Jesus himself taught the truth of Genesis from a literal historical point of view. When addressing the Pharisees who attempted to trap him in this theological argument regarding divorce, Jesus responds from the book of Genesis. And he says this, actually, in Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Therefore, they are neither male 
uh, no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. We can get into the actual theology of what he taught later, but if Jesus taught and believed the words of Genesis, then we would be well advised to do the same. Now, question, before we get too far into this, can someone be a born-again believing Christian without believing the literal words of Genesis? Yes, we have to acknowledge absolutely yes, we can. But they do so without a solid biblical foundation. The plain meaning of the words of Genesis have to be intentionally reinterpreted or ignored in any attempt to try to reconcile the Bible with any theory of evolution, be that theistic evolution or otherwise. So yes, someone can be a Christian and reject the first 10 chapters of Genesis as being literal, but that's going to be, I tell you, a Christian in conflict because they're going to be at odds with their theology. It's far better to be on solid biblical ground than really try to maintain a reputation in the eyes of the world, and that's really the only reason to sacrifice the first 10 chapters of Genesis anyway. Guess what? If Christians aren't hated for our stand on Genesis, we're going to be hated for other reasons. Jesus made that much clearer. They hated him first, they'll hate us too. So why not just hold to the plain teaching of the Bible knowing that God's never going to be proven wrong? All right? Okay, so let's get into the text. Although the text can be broken up by the various genealogies, as I mentioned, I think it's far better to look at Genesis from a more thematic point of view. We need to remember that the overall message of the Bible is this. We talked about this last week. God writes every wrong through Jesus Christ. That's a message from Genesis to Revelation. God writes every wrong through Jesus Christ. And the book of Genesis provides the foundation for that. First, we see what God did right. After that, we see what man did in making it wrong. And then we see what God did to begin his plan to make it all right again. So that means we have to have the creation of everything. It means we have to have the creation of the people through whom God would bring Jesus. And so that gives us two broad divisions to the book of Genesis. First is the beginning of the world. The second is the beginning of the nation. So the first section covers everything from creation, the fall, the flood, the spread of humanity. The second deals with the beginning of God's chosen covenant people, the nation of Israel. That first section brings up the need for the second section because it's in the fall of mankind that creation is corrupted. And God's eternal plan is to set it all right again in Jesus Christ. But for Jesus to come according to God's plan, then a nation has to be born. All right, therein is the book of Genesis. So you want to have your Bibles open because we'll be flipping fast through some of this. Chapter 1, we're going to try to take it chapter by chapter as far as we can get. We'll see how far we go tonight. But chapter 1 starts with an overview of Genesis. And just as you read in those first few uh, a couple of verses, it sums it up in advance. Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. The existence of God we see here is assumed. And it is the beginning of time and creation that's taught. It's not the beginning of God. God has always existed. What happened before God? Well, there is nothing before God. The God is just always is. And yes, that blows our mind, but God is beyond our understanding in that aspect. He is eternal from uh, every point of view that there is. So this is the beginning of time, not of God. God in all of his fullness has always existed. In fact, we see it here in the plural form of the word God, but We can get into that some other time. It's in his perfect will and his timing that he desires to bring forth something at the beginning, this point in time. God brought it all forth through an act of his creative will. His presence hovers over the face of the waters. Of course, Genesis 1 tells us there are six days of creation that's listed. First day was light coming out of darkness. Uh, Second day is the division of waters. You've got the division, basically, of the heavens, the atmosphere, Uh, from the the oceans. On day three, you see the creation of dry land and vegetation. God establishes shorelines for the the continents. Day four, we see the stars created in the universe. Day five are the air creatures and the sea creatures, basically the birds and the fish, everything in the sea. And then, of course, on day six are land creatures and humans. Now, there's a lot of objections that come up to this first objection is often raised is how did God create light before he created stars? Because light starts on day one. Stars don't come till day four. We need to remember that God's glory is often described as being radiant light. 
And that's not dependent on stars. It's independent completely of stars. All it's dependent on is God himself. And of course, God has always been. So he creates light. Second objection that's often raised is how do we know that those days of creation are literal days and not ages? Well, frankly, because that's a natural interpretation of the text. Morning and evening is a very specific way of referring to a day, a natural day. God doesn't tell us there were many evenings and many mornings. No, just evening and morning. Now again, is it possible that this could be interpreted as ages? Well, anything's possible, I suppose. There just any, isn't any indication that the Bible does it that way. It just plainly says evening and morning was the day. And so there it is. Another objection. Couldn't this all just be symbolic mythological teaching? After all, days 1 through 3 seem to be very parallel to days 4 through 6. Couldn't Genesis 1 just be some way of teaching that you know, God's behind it all, and this is just the best way of communicating it to the people at the time because they didn't have the technology to see beyond the stars and uh, calculate the speed of light or anything like that? Well, that's a stretch. If we do interpret it that way, then it really calls into question how we interpret everything else in the Bible. The best interpretation of the Scripture is a natural reading. For instance, if something reads like a a metaphor when Jesus says, I am the door, well, then we interpret it as a metaphor. You're not a literal door. It's a metaphor. If something reads like a poem, then we interpret it as a poem. But if it reads like history, then we need to interpret it like history. Now, the common objection here is that Genesis 1 reads like a myth. But how exactly is the origin of the universe supposed to read? In fact, this is far more detailed than other religious myths uh, in other uh, cultures about the world being created and placed on the back of a tortoise or being placed on the shoulders of a giant. In fact, when we look at the book of Genesis in comparison with other world religions, it's extremely systematic in its layout without veering into all kinds of unbelievable descriptions. It shows how God created, and this is how he did it. In other words, it reads like history. And thus, we need to interpret it as history. That's chapter 1. Chapter 2 is the detail of creations. We see the first humans. We see the first marriage. Before the, the detail actually is given, um, the Sabbath is described being the seventh day. Chapter 1 takes us through days 1 through 6. The seventh day comes in chapter 2. And that's the day that he rested. Question, did God need to rest? Well, of course not. God did specifically rest to call attention to this period of rest. We read in chapter 2, verse 3, Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work in which God created and made. Now, why would God need or desire to set apart this day as being holy? He sanctified it. He set it apart as holy. Why is that? Well, because ultimately it points to Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 10 through 11 says, For he who has entered his rest himself has also ceased from his works as God did from his. There, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Contextually, just to give you an idea of what's going on here, God given the Sabbath to the Hebrews as a sign of their covenant. They were to rest Every seventh day, every other culture was working six, seven days a week. They were working only six. They were trusting in God on the seventh. They set apart from the rest of the nations. And so they're resting. They're trusting in God for God's provision. Well, that's one form of rest. Well, God had also promised rest to the Hebrews from their wilderness wanderings. And the writer of Hebrews said, well, they were going to enter into the rest when they got into the promised land. But the fact is, when they got there, they didn't rest. The Sabbath continued. The true rest, the writer of Hebrews says, is only found in the work of Jesus. When the promised Messiah provides rest from spiritual labors, we can't work our way into the salvation of God. We've got to rest in the work that Jesus has done for us. That is the entire point of the Sabbath day. And God provided that testimony when, all the way back to the very first week of creation, before there's even a need for salvation, God points to the rest that we have in salvation in Genesis chapter 2. Of course, the obvious question is, have you entered into that rest? Or are you still trying to prove yourself righteous in the eyes of God? Still trying to work your way into salvation? You can't do it. You have to rest in the work that's already been done, that's already completed in Jesus Christ, who is our Sabbath rest. 
Of course, once those seven days of the first week are described, we're given a more in-depth description of the creation of man, starting at Genesis 2, verse 4. Of course, this is the first mention of Genesis here in the origins, the Genesis, the uh, genealogy. God had created the earth. He created the animals. He planted a garden. He provided everything that was needed for the pinnacle of his creation, and that was humans. God formed man from the dust of the ground, not through an evolutionary chain of other animals, but from the dust of the ground. He breathed into him to give him life. God gave man the responsibility to care for the garden, thus creating work. Work originally intended to be pleasurable. It didn't become a curse until after the fall. And then he commanded, of course, not to eat from one particular tree under penalty of death. Now, up to this point, everything that God created, God had called good, but there was one thing that was not good. That was what? Adam's loneliness. So God brought the woman out of Adam's side, joined her to Adam in a marriage relationship ordained by God. Now, because this is in the culture, we've got to address it. The Bible, of course, neither condemns singleness nor childlessness by this account and only shows the origin of marriage. Because God created marriage, God's the one who defines marriage, and that's not something that's subject to the whims of cultures. Cultures change left and right. God never does. And when God saw the need to create a partner for Adam, God did so specifically by making someone different to and complementary to Adam. Thus he created Eve, who is taken from the man, who completes the man in one flesh. And any perversion of that standard, be it multiple partners, be it adulterous relationships, be it homosexuality or whatever, that is outside of God's will. The relationship that God established is the one he established as good, and that's not something that we can tamper with. All right, so that's chapter 2. Everything's good to this point. Husband and wife have lived in sweet communion with God. Everything has gone according to God's plan. That's when Satan appears and provides the very first temptation. He perverts the word of God. He causes Eve to question whether or not God even spoke the truth. Eve is unable to respond according to what God actually said, and she succumbs to the temptation and deception of the devil. Now, unmentioned up to that point, by the way, is Adam. Adam's also willing to eat of the fruit of the tree, Never bothers to correct his bride on what God actually said. Never tries to step in and protect her like he should have done. But he eats of the tree, and now sin has entered the world. The eyes of Adam and Eve are open to what they've done. The intimacy they once enjoyed with God now becomes shameful, and they hide themselves. God confronts them in their sin. Adam and Eve confess, albeit somewhat hesitantly. And then God acts in accordance with his righteousness, and he pronounces curses upon all three of them, the serpent, the woman, and the man. To the woman, God sentenced her to painful childbirth, subjection to her husband. To the man, God sentenced him to laborious work and death. To the serpent, God sentenced that uh, far more harshly than what you might expect of a mere animal. He did, of course, have to crawl on his belly and eat dust. And, but it prophesies, this curse that God gave to the serpent, prophesies of a greater, more permanent defeat that awaits in the future. We can look over at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. You shall bruise, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, although not too many women are fond of snakes, it's doubtful this is a reference to herpetophobia, right? That's not what it's talking about here. There will be a long-lasting war between that which was behind the serpent and human beings, one that's only going to be resolved through the seed of the woman. Now, if you've been with us on Sunday mornings, we've talked about this a little bit in the past. There's a problem that comes up here because biologically, this doesn't sound possible. Biologically, women have eggs. Men have seed. Then how could there be a seed from a woman? We'll answer if the woman experiences a virgin birth. Genesis 3.15 is often called a proto-evangelium or the first gospel. We see in Genesis 3, 15, a miraculous son promised to come according to the genealogy of humans that will one day have victory over the evil that the serpent had wrought. And this is a promise of Jesus Christ, who not only had victory over death in his own resurrection, but who gives a promise of victory over death to all those who believe upon him as Lord. How important are these first few chapters of Genesis? Enough to provide the foundation for the gospel in which we trust. There's no need for salvation apart from Genesis 1, 2, and 3. But in it, we already have the promise of it. 
After the curse, God provides the very first sacrifice in the Bible. It shows the need for blood to be shed on account of sin. Looking forward, of course, to the ultimate sacrifice in Jesus. As a result of their sin, Adam and Eve are evicted from the garden. They're forbidden to eat from the tree of life. By the way, that's the mercy of God. Because otherwise, Adam may have lived forever in a sinful state. So God forces Adam to, to leave. And Adam will die outside, but he'll die while trusting in the promise of the coming Savior. And that's, of course, the promise of salvation. Now, things are going to move a lot more quickly from this point. In chapter 4, Cain and Abel come. That's, of course, the very first murder in the Bible. Sin is so evil in its scope that not a single generation passes before sin moves from just rebellion, as bad as that is, to murder outright. Cain was jealous of his brother, as we know. His offering of a sacrificial animal was uh, accepted to God. Abel's was. Again, that's looking forward to the sacrifice of Christ. Cain's was not. He kills his brother. He attempts to hide his sin. That proves to be impossible. God allows him to live for a time, but he curses him to be this wandering vagabond on the earth. Cain continues to have sons and daughters who sadly follow in his footsteps, one committing murder. Chapter 5 looks at the genealogy of Adam. The family of Adam lives beyond, of course, Cain and Abel. Adam's third son is Seth, and that lineage then continues. Men living with several centuries in their lifespan at a time. And that genealogy takes us all the way into the introduction of Noah in chapter 6. Chapter 6, Noah is introduced. The context for the times is provided. Humans had entered into truly evil times. God determined that he wasn't going to strive with man forever. He regretted even that he made man at all. He gave a timeline of 120 years until uh, he would destroy the earth. He purposed the destruction of every man excepting that of Noah, who's described as being just and perfect, as someone who walked with God, chapter 6, verse 9. Obviously, Noah was just as fallen as any other human was who had come from the line of Adam, but he sought the Lord God in faith, and so God extended to Noah saving grace. By the way, salvation has always been by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. No matter what era in which someone has lived, be that thousands of years prior to Christ or thousands of years after Christ. We might ask, why did God choose to save Noah instead of wiping out all of humanity, starting over completely from scratch? Why is that? Because the lineage of Adam needed to be preserved. Remember, God had a plan to right every wrong through Jesus Christ, and he promised then to bring forth Jesus Christ, that Savior, through the seed of a woman, Eve. And so for that promise to be kept, the lineage of Adam needed to be preserved. Even if it was through one family, it would be enough to preserve that one lineage so God would always be true to his word. God is faithful to every single promise, something that's even demonstrated when he brings worldwide judgment. And God, of course, gives Noah for instructions for building the ark, describes this massive ship that's used to preserve the lives of Noah's family and the land animals and birds. Noah did exactly what was commanded of him. We need to keep in mind that just believing God on this would be an act of faith, much less the actual construction of the ark. The Bible gives the indication that it had never rained to this point, but a mist had watered the ground. We read that in chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. So Noah believed God before he ever acted upon God's word, and it's for that reason that Noah became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith, as it says in Hebrews eleven seven of him. Well, in chapter 7, we actually read about the global flood. The ark's built. Noah and his family, the animals are inside. God brings forth a flood. We tend to picture in our mind as this huge rainstorm, little more than that. But the Bible describes it in truly violent terms. Look at chapter 7, uh, verses 11 and 12. It says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, And the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. The day is recorded. The exact day is recorded. Why? Because it's such a monumental event. This wasn't a 40-day rain shower. This was an upheaval, a breaking up of planet earth. The fountains, it said, of the great deep were broken up, indicating massive earthquakes, sudden torrential flooding. And such an event would be expected to bring such drastic change upon the earth's surface, quickly burying animals, humans, and plants in a way. You know, they don't have time to decompose, but just succumb to time and pressure, and either fossilize or become carbon-based fuel, like coal or gas. We would expect to see signs of sea life on mountains that had erupted. We would expect to see all kinds of things that we actually do see in the uh, geological record every single day. 
It was a violent event of global proportions. And I would suggest to you an unbiased interpretation of scientific data bears it out, leaves proof of everything that actually happened written for us in the pages of Genesis. Well, why was it so violent? Well, because it was the judgment of God, that's why. We tend to put cartoon pictures of Noah's Ark in children's books. Thinks nicely, you know, we've got this little floating zoo in our mind. The reality was anything but cartoonish. All but eight humans on the planet were killed. That's bad. Why The wages of sin is death. And that's dramatically illustrated in the global flood. At the same time, the gift of God is life, is salvation in Jesus Christ. Something else that's dramatically illustrated in the global flood. Well, how is Noah saved? Well, by faith in God, being hidden in a place of safety by the hand of God. And guess what? We find our refuge in Jesus Christ. We're hidden away in him, being sealed by the Holy Spirit. Something that's illustrated so wonderfully here. Chapter 8, Noah's delivered the rain and the torrents. Those lasted 40 days, but the flood itself lasted a lot longer. It wasn't until 150 days later that the waters began to decrease. Ten months passed before the tops of the mountains were seen again. Noah had released a couple of birds to determine the availability of land. The first was a raven that proved useless. It just flew around nonstop. The second was a dove that would go out and return to the ark until it found a place to live. Now, at that point, Noah knew it was safe, but he stayed in the ark. Why? Because he was waiting on the command of God. He didn't move until God told him to move. When God did, he left. Chapter 9. Well, that takes us to Noah's covenant. The earth needed to be repopulated. God commanded Noah and his sons to be fruitful and multiply. He gave the humans permission to eat animal meat, but restrained them from drinking blood. Obviously, an unhealthy practice, but also a sign of rebellion against God because God alone gives life. God establishes his covenant with Noah, gives the covenant sign of the rainbow. It's a symbol that he would never again destroy the earth by flood. Now, there will come a time where God does destroy the earth again, but it will be by fire, it won't be by flood. Noah's family is also described showing the blessing of God upon Shem, and that's the line now that we're following. Again, we're following one family line through whom the Messiah will come. Well, that's through Shem's line. Chapter 10, Uh, this is often called the table of nations. It's the genealogy of Noah, really of his sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Every nation of the world has its origins in them. The Bible shows how um, people eventually settle throughout the world. Some continue to follow after God. Some continue to rebel against God. We all have a common ancestry, though. We all go back to Noah. I like what Kim Ham points out here. Uh, There's no need for racism. We have one race, the human race. We all have the same background. We all have the same ancestry. We all go back and to Noah, we all go back to Adam, which also means, by the way, we also have the same need for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that takes us, of course, directly to the Tower of Babel, starting in chapter 11. Uh, The Tower of Babel, that origin of different languages is told. Man had once again rebelled against God, thought itself capable of rising up to heaven. Obviously, that's impossible. God had no fear of man. God didn't act because he was afraid. But God confused them to keep them from carrying out their foolish plans, so he confuses their languages. By the way, this is one more thing that is set right in Jesus Christ. Uh, Of course, some of this we see in the gift of tongues and interpretations. That's how that's often presented in the book of Acts. But we are also truly reconciled as one people together in heaven. We're once again together with God, no more separation from him. The Tower of Babel undone, made right in Jesus Christ. The second half of chapter 11 continues that genealogical line, eventually leads to Abram. And Abram and his wife Sarai are introduced, and that's the family that the Bible is going to follow follow all the way through the rest of the New Testament. Chapter 12, then. This is really where that line, that major division ends. That first half was the creation of the world, the beginning of the world. Now we're really looking at the beginning of the nation, starting in chapter 12. Abram's calling. God graciously calls Abram. Did Abram do anything to deserve God's calling? Absolutely not. God just picked him out. No work of his own. Offers him a glorious promise of blessing. Not only would Abram be made a great nation, but the promise of the seed of the woman was given to him, as we see in chapter 12, verse 3. Through him, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's the messianic promise. Abram, his wife, his nephew, Lot, they eventually obey the Lord. It takes a little bit of time. They arrive in Canaan. Abram bitches his tent there, builds an altar. He doesn't stay long. 
He goes to Egypt during a famine, and his trust in the Lord wavers a little bit. He tells a half-truth about his half-sister, who is his full bride. And God mercifully protects Sarai from Pharaoh's advances and Abraham's faultiness here. Chapter 13, that's his inheritance. That's when Abraham returns to the land, and he's blessed uh, to the extent that you know, he and Lot, they've grown so numerous in their holdings that they can't share the same land any longer due to the size of the wealth. So Abram says, Lot, you choose which side is best. You go where you want to go. Lot chooses what he thinks is better. It's actually going to take him all the way to Sodom, lead him to his downfall. All that remains, it seems like that's a leftover. God says, no, that's the very best. And that's what God had promised to give Abram, everything that he could see at that point. Chapter 14, we see Abram as a deliverer. He has a incredible encounter with this priest named Melchizedek. Uh, see, Lot is taken captive. He's caught up in a war uh, that because he's now a resident of Sodom and Gomorrah that's in this war, and he's taken captive. Abram has to come to his rescue. Abram's grown in wealth. He's grown in influence now, enough to command a small army, and Abram brings Lot out of captivity. By the way, that prefigures the deliverance we have in Christ Jesus. We're taken captive by sin and death and all the rest. And Jesus comes and he rescues us. Well, that's what Abram did for Lot. And Abram then gives thanks to God when he meets this, God, this priest of God Most High by the name of Melchizedek. And Abram gives this priest a tithe of all that he'd received from battle. He worships God. And then he goes on to encounter a second person at this time. And that's the king of Sodom who offered Abram all kinds of blessings. Well, Abram refused to receive anything from Sodom because he'd already given his worship to the Lord God. What does that sound like? Well, that prefigures Jesus' worship, or prefigures Jesus' refusal, rather, to worship Satan because he was going to worship God alone. Melchizedek, by the way, becomes a very important figure later on in the book of Hebrews because he provides the model for Jesus' own priesthood. Melchizedek was both king and priest, just as Jesus is. Melchizedek was king of Salem and uh, the high priest, priest of God most high. And the priesthood of Melchizedek is superior to that of the Levites because uh, Levi through Abraham paid homage and he paid tithes to Melchizedek. We read that in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 9. Thus, Jesus' priesthood is superior to all. Jesus is the great high king of Israel. He's the great high priest of God most high whose kingdom and whose priesthood will never end. And by the way, some scholars even think that Melchizedek himself may have been the pre-incarnate uh, Jesus. Chapter 15, we read of Abram's covenant. It was after Abram demonstrated his worship of God alone through Melchizedek that God once again came to Abram, reaffirmed his covenant promise to him. God would give him an heir. God would make him a great nation. Now, Abram didn't have a clue how God would do it, but he knew that God could do it and he would do it. And so his faith then becomes a model for our salvation. Look at Genesis 15, verse 6. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. See, this is the verse that the Apostle Paul will come back to when teaching of the doctrine of salvation by faith alone. Romans chapter 4, verse 3. Romans chapter 4, verse 22. Abram had done nothing to save himself. All that he had was faith in God's promise. And of course, Abram's faith moved him to action which is going to be demonstrated later on, but it demonstrates the sincerity of his faith. And James references this in James chapter 2, verse 23. Abram was not saved by his acts. He was saved solely by the grace of God. But as a sign of God's promise, God performed this covenant ceremony that shows that it's an unconditional work on God's behalf. His glory passes in a dream through the series of slaughtered animals. And he's showing that God is going to be faithful to perform whatever he promised, no matter what. Even though... Abram's descendants would be kept slaves in Egypt for 400 years, which God warned him about at this time. God would bring them out again. God would fulfill his word. God would bring forth this Messiah. Again, everything's pointing to that act when God would make everything right through Jesus. Now, God promised to do the work. Doesn't mean that people don't get in the way. And that's what we see in chapter 16 with Hagar. See, Abraham had lapsed in his faith earlier. Now it's Sarai's turn. She tries to manipulate the promise of God. She tries to rush the promise of God. God wasn't moving fast enough for her sake, so she tried to find a way to make it happen. She gave her maid, Hagar, to Abram as a wife. Abram indeed had a son by her, but he was not the son of promise. And Sarai was willing to let Hagar and Ishmael uh, perish in the wilderness after she got fed up with it all. <laughs> 
God was merciful. Ishmael would not let the uh, would, uh, Ishmael would not bring uh, be the nation that brings forth the Messiah, but he of course would be great. He would be numerous, and uh, we still live with the effects of that decision to this very day because he would be the foundation for the Islamic faith. That takes us to chapter seventeen. Still, God is affirming His promise to Abram. Years had gone by since God first promised Abram a son. Now 99 years old, God appears to Abram again, reiterates his promise, even changes Abram's name to Abraham. So he's not yet had but one son, and that wasn't even the son of the promise. But now he's the father of multitudes. But God had made this covenant promise earlier. And God's showing himself faithful to this covenant promise. And he commands Abram to take the sign of the covenant, which is circumcision, a symbol of cutting away of the flesh, trusting God by faith. Of course, he believed, he obeyed. Chapter 18. We have the promised son now, finally. God, once again, a year later, reappears to Abram, reiterates a promise, saying that the time was at hand. Now, Sarah doubted at this time. God confronted her lack of belief, giving her the opportunity to believe. And it was at this time that God was ready to judge Sodom. Abraham beautifully intercedes on their behalf. Great study there if you want to learn how to intercede for the lost. Asking God to spare the city if even ten righteous men were there. Now, ten righteous men weren't even in Sodom at that time. Not even ten. There was one, it was Lot. We read about him in chapter 19. It's an amazing thing that the Bible even calls Lot a righteous man, but it does affirm that in 2 Peter 2, verse 7. Lot was caught up in the midst of a terribly sinful city, and he offered his own daughters to a sexually perverted mob just to spare the angelic visitors that had come to him. Of course, the angels rescued Lot from the city. Sodom was destroyed. All sorts of immorality happened. Lot's daughters thought that their family line was lost. They committed incest with their father and thus birthed the nations of Moab and Ammon. More of Israel's constant enemies later on. Chapter 20, we get to Abraham's fear. After everything that Abraham had experienced to this point, he experiences another lapse of faith. Which is a great lesson to us just in this, because God used Abraham in immense ways, and how often do we lapse in our faith? God still held out his promise, his grace to Abram. And he put Sarah, Abraham does, in the exact same situation he placed her years earlier with the Egyptian Pharaoh. This time it was with Abimelech. God once again intervenes, he protects them. Again, we see Isaac and Ishmael uh, at odds with one another because Isaac's born, and Sarai tries to intervene again she sends hagar and ishmael away to die again god again shows his mercy oh goodness gracious we're only in chapter 22 this is as far as we're going to get tonight but this is one of the best parts so far the promised son has come god puts everything to the test he commands abraham to take his son notice it says in chapter 22 verse 2 his only son why is that because that's the son of the promise his only son, to Mount Moriah, lay him on the altar and sacrifice him to God as a burnt offering. Now, one can only imagine what went through Abraham's mind as he took Isaac up on that mountain in obedience. Now, the entire time, Abraham seemed to be trusting that God would keep his earlier promise regarding Isaac. He, he had told the people who had gone with him, you guys stay here, we, the boy and I, we will return to you knowing that God had told him to take Isaac up on that mountain to sacrifice him unto death. And he was trusting that God could even raise the dead if necessary. Do you doubt that? Well, the New Testament tells us specifically that thing in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, that he was trusting in God to raise the dead. He had faith in the resurrection. How are people saved? By grace through faith in Jesus Christ, always. Abraham had raised his hand to kill his son. He stopped at the last possible moment by the angel of the Lord. In other words, the pre-incarnate Jesus And he said, God will provide himself the sacrifice. Once again, in a most glorious way, it prefigures the sacrifice of Jesus for us. Our lives were required for our sins, but God provided for himself the sacrifice. How so? In the form of the lamb, not a lamb caught in the thicket, but the lamb that willingly laid down his life for us, the Lord Jesus Christ. So God once again confirms his covenant. And Abraham goes down in history as the father of all faith. Now, I know we promised it was going to be one book once a week. Just couldn't do it with Genesis tonight because it's not only the start of, the, of course, the Pentateuch, it's the start of the Bible. And there's so much of our faith that finds its foundations in those first few chapters. We had to spend some time there, all right? 
We'll cover the rest next time. Lord willing. What's the theme of the Bible? God writes every wrong through Jesus Christ. We see it already. Oh, God created it good. It was so very good. It went wrong. Don't think that God was taken by surprise. No, God knew exactly what would happen. He already had a plan in place, and he sets it in motion immediately. Not a single second passes by the time that first sin is confronted, when he's already promising Jesus. The sin hadn't even happened when he already showed the rest that we would have in Jesus. God knew exactly what he would be doing. And he sets his plan in motion. He's going to take it all the way through to this one family that's going to bring forth this one Savior that's going to be good for all the world. And in that we can rejoice. And we look forward to picking up the story the next time. Father, we thank you so much. Thank you so much for sending Jesus for us. Lord, I thank you for every single person here when we have placed our faith and trust in Jesus and the sacrifice that you provided, that you have given us salvation. I thank you, Lord, that you didn't require us to lay down our own lives. That is what was demanded, but Lord, you provided yourself the sacrifice. And just like you provided a sacrifice for Abraham, for Isaac, You provide Jesus a sacrifice for us. And so we thank you. Lord, I do pray that if there are any here who have not received that sacrifice, that tonight that they would, they would place their faith, their trust, their hope in Jesus, asking Jesus to, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of the things that I've done wrong. Restore me to a right relationship with God to where I can live with you forever. Lord, give them the words that they need to entrust their lives to you and to receive you as their Lord and their God. We thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.